If we could have witnessed the formation of our sun and its planets from clouds of gas and dust, it would have looked a little like this. The colors and lighting are exaggerated to allow you to see details you couldn't have seen with your naked eye from this distance, but the greatest exaggeration by far concerns the passage of time. If you'd like to make the simulation more realistic, get comfortable, pause the video, and stare at that one frame for a thousand years while the chair beneath you and the building around you crumble. And then do the same with the next frame and the next thousand frames. And when you see a glow at the center of the swirling cloud, you only have about another 10 million years before that glow can truly be called a star. But don't go looking for Earth just yet. You wouldn't recognize the old place. And even if you did, it would be another 100 million years before it would be cool enough to set foot on it. But let's say we stick around as the planet cools and it rains comets, and we watch the steaming oceans rise, drop by drop, underneath a black sky. It will be another 500 million years before we notice bacteria on the surface of the water. Half a billion years by the water's edge. That's long enough for the wind to erode mountains, for the moon to drift seemingly out of reach, for the rocky shoreline to become sand. More than enough time, I think, to reveal the prospect of eternal existence as the fool's dream that it always was. But that is how long it took for lifeless carbon and electromagnetic attraction to stumble upon a complex form that self-replicates. Five hundred million years. So now we have life. We watch the bacteria spread. The more efficient photosynthesizers with more available energy spread faster, producing oxygen as a waste product, thereby granting us a blue, more earthly sky under which we can wait for multicellular life to form. So we wait for another 3,000 million years. But soon after, Comparatively speaking, life explodes from the oceans and the last billion years between us and our destination simply fly by. And here we are, today, trying to deal with it all. What do we know about time? Would it be cruel to tell an adult mayfly that it only has one afternoon? Would it still fly as far and as high as it could? Might it fly further and higher than usual? Or would it forget about its wings and sit on the water, head bowed, sufficiently traumatized to invent religion? Seems nature has given most organisms the same two options when facing fear of any kind. Fight or flight. We can run away from what we fear and cower and wait for what comes. Or we can stop running, turn around, face our fears and fight them. But what if what frightens the mayfly is reality itself? Well, in that case, the mayfly would need to find something to counteract reality, some kind of anti-reality, something that can make fact seem like fiction, and vice versa. You know, like religion. Religion has amazing powers. It can unite people by the millions and turn sadness into joy. It can soothe the shattered heart and triumph over mountains of contradictory evidence and inspire rapturous belief where none seemed possible before. Unfortunately, you could say exactly the same thing about lying. Lies, like salesmen, like gods, need us to believe in them. But there is always a price. If we allow ourselves to be convinced that we exist by the will of an infinitely powerful and judgmental God, we instantly, conceptually, reduce ourselves to the role of puppet. If we believe we were preordained, we lose sight of how easily we might never have existed at all. Religious explanations by necessity blind us to the truth, until we can't recognize ourselves as beings that took 14 billion years to open our eyes. Are we no better than insects? What if the adult mayfly had not just one afternoon, but almost a whole century? What if they were not simply bugs, but beings with minds capable of almost godlike knowledge? Better than godlike if the knowledge exhibited in the Bible and the Quran are anything to go by. What if these things that saw themselves as bugs were actually the offspring of ancient stars? 
would we still need to lie? What happens if we do the unthinkable and stand our ground? When we look backwards through time, we see humans change into something else, which also changes as the surrounding land changes, slowly. And further back in time, life falls into molecular pieces and eventually starts to glow with the excess heat of the early Earth and ultimately floats back into space along with every last atom of the planet, back to the gas and dust it was before. And that dust is still there to this day. It's everywhere. Everywhere stars have ever died, you can find it streaked and smeared along, across and between the spiral arms of the galaxies. And it's in you. In your arm. In your hand. We're made of it. When we speak, it speaks. When we love, it loves. The question of whether this universe was created depends on whether the creation of universes is possible. If it is possible, then it's possible our existence was intended. The truth is that no physicist, no matter how religious, ever needed God to balance any equation. Perhaps this is telling us something. If you follow time all the way back, if you go looking for truth through the only objective, unbiased eyes we know, the hypersensitive cameras, sensors and detectors inside our scientific instruments, there's a very good chance you'll end up here, the moment just after the beginning of the universe. Some can't even bear to look at it. Some can't look away. Some see it and just shrug, even though it's surely as staggering as any thought can be. If anything can ever honestly be described as wonderful, this is it, for it contains all the wonder of which we know. Of course you can pray. I understand, we're only apes after all, and it is staggering. All we have to do is not lie. Don't say you know its name. Don't say it told you to tell people what to do with their lives. Don't say those that believe otherwise must be punished. Don't say it sends earthquakes and tsunamis. Don't say it ever hurts anyone for any reason, because that is sick. But most of all, don't give away our dignity. That love you feel inside, those pure selfless feelings, your sense of duty and beauty, your willingness to help, to do what's right and fair, honest and kind. We call such things divine, but they evolved within and come from the heart of an ape. And that part of the nature of this beast may be our species' one saving grace, the only way we'll ever have to look at ourselves honestly and see more than an insect, an ape, or a puppet. Don't give it away. Don't give it away. They say science offers no moral guidance, and that's true. But it brings a perspective from which even a single mayfly becomes a wonder. The religious instinctively resist the knowledge that we are apes. I dare say a chimpanzee informed that it evolved from a lemur-like creature would be similarly appalled. So much and so little has changed. The canopy of leaves overhead from which we came has been replaced by stars. But we can still look up and see our home. And when daylight comes, see not a star but a close relation, the eye of the needle through which we have all passed. What if God wasn't a God at all? What if all they could do for us was give us the chance of life and the rest was down to us? You don't deny your parents just because they couldn't give you everything, do you? If someone saved you from drowning, effectively giving you life, would you thank them? or ask them to push you back in the sea because they couldn't make you immortal as well. So, what horror awaits the truth seeker that dares to look at the coldest, hardest reality we know? They say that if you look into the abyss for long enough, the abyss looks into you. I'd go further. I'd say that sometimes if you stare long and hard enough, the abyss reaches out and pulls you in and grinds your face into the lifeless nuclear ashes of dead stars 
forcing you to see the chaos and the imperfection. And then the harshest reality of all demands that you recant, demands that you take back your claim that you saw beauty down here. And yet, if you go deep enough, there it is again. Dust. Dust that dreams. Dust that loves. Dust with courage and kindness. Dust that sings. Some things are as close to miracles as to make hardly any difference at all. The biggest joy was on the way home. In my cockpit window every two minutes, the earth, the moon, the sun, and a whole 360 degree panorama of the heavens. And that was the powerful, overwhelming experience. And suddenly I realized that the molecules of my body and the molecules of the spacecraft, and the molecules in the body of my partners were prototyped and manufactured in some ancient generation of stars. And that was an overwhelming sense of oneness, of connectedness. It wasn't them and us, it was, that's me, that's all of it, it's, it's one thing. And it was accompanied by an ecstasy, a sense of, oh my God, wow, yes, an insight, an epiphany.